As we ask the Lord to speak to us, let's pray together. Lord, speak and let the earth hear your voice. Lord, speak and silence every distraction. Lord, speak and send away every unclean spirit. Lord, speak and subdue our flesh that resists and refuses your voice. Lord, speak by your spirit in your word. In this moment, we ask, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, it's wonderful to have a worship service where we get to hear from the children. So we're seeing every sort of age and generation in the worship service. And it's also always good to get an update from what's happening on the mission field. And so as we heard in this service from Tanzania and from Cabrino Bucaria, we hear from uh, the different ages and then even from different ethnicities or tribes and tongues, what's happening. There's so many changes all around the world and so many different ages and different experiences even in this very room. And among all those variables, the one thing that's the same is we all open our Bible to the same spot to listen to the same word. And the amazing thing about scripture is that there's nothing... There's nothing more unchanging and eternal than the word of God. It's set and it's so perfect that it never changes. And at the same time, there's nothing more dynamic and there's nothing that's more intrusive in right what's happening today as the word of God. In other words, if you ever think about it like if you leave your Bible up on the shelf and it collects dust, Nothing is supposed to interrupt you day to day as much as the word of God because the word of God is living and active and whatever is happening in your life, the unchanging eternal word of God that's so perfect that it never changes, the dynamics of your life make the word of God sort of intervene in your life in a dozen different ways today than it did yesterday because of the dynamics of your life. And so I'm always... Uh, up on my tiptoes to see what's going to happen when we look into the word of God and how it's going to intervene and interrupt our lives from day to day as we look at it. So we'll be in Hebrews chapter 12. We'll be in the last paragraph of this chapter, verses 25 through 29. And I just point out the last verse, verse 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12 starts in verse 1 with the word therefore. And it says, therefore, since we're looking at Jesus, let's run the race. And then it gives some, it gives, uh, I would say, five commands there in verses 1 through 3. Look to Jesus, run the race. And then after those commands in verses 1 through 3, it backs up those commands with this sort of reason, which is the discipline of God in verses 4 through 11. And then... We have a second therefore in verse 12. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands, and strengthen your weak knees, and actually I count eight commands in verses 12 through 17. And then it backs up those commands with this illustration of the two mountains in verses 18 through 24. And then we have three more commands in our text today, verses 25 through 28. We're gonna see the command, see to it that you don't refuse, and then the command, be grateful, for receiving, and then the command to offer worship. And then we have a third, therefore, in verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving this kingdom, for our God is a consuming fire. So as we look at this text, we'll look at 25 through 29 together, but let's start up in verses 1 and 2. You see it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Verse 29, 4. Our God is a consuming fire. 
Then it says in verse 12, therefore lift up your drooping hands, verse 12. Strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what's lame may not be put out of joint but healed. Verse 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Then it says in verse 18, you haven't come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and a mountain, And it says in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. The backbone of the book of Hebrews is the warning passages. There are six or eight of them, depending how you count them. The warning passages make up the backbone of the book of Hebrews. And this, verses 25 through 29, ending with the warning that our God is a consuming fire, is the final and last warning in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is filled with all sorts of truth about angels, Melchizedek, the exodus, the wilderness, the tabernacles, all of or the tabernacle, the temple, all of these things. And yet the reason that all of those things are present in the book of Hebrews is for this purpose, to lead to the unignorable warnings not to drift away from Jesus. This is what the book of Hebrews is about. William Hendrickson has a really good commentary on the book of Hebrews, and this is, these are the uh, three sentences on the very first page of his commentary on Hebrews. And I dare you to dismiss these sentences as, as having nothing to do with our day. Hendrickson writes on the first page of his commentary, if there's one book of the New Testament that exhorts Christians to remain faithful in the last days, it is the epistle to the Hebrews. This epistle has a special message for anyone who lives in an age of apostasy. This epistle speaks to any believer who faces all around him unbelief and disobedience and who has to stand firm when many are falling away. That's what this book is about. That's why everything that's in it is in it. It's a warning from a well-intended and heartfelt leader in the church who loves the people to whom he's speaking and he has a direct message to them which is don't drift don't give up stay strong in Jesus the book of Hebrews is not like a lazy line thrown into the pond and we're just sort of sipping sweet tea and half asleep and wondering what's going to nibble the book of Hebrews is more like a mom hurtling toward her child who is wandering out onto the interstate. This book is meant to tackle you and rescue you from eternally harming yourself because this whole world around us pulls us away, encourages us to drift from Jesus, to get wrapped up in the passing pleasures of sin. All of the things that are shaken, all of the things that are shaken attract us and charm us all the time. And this book is this unforgettable warning saying it's only the things that cannot be shaken that are worth your life's commitment. And so our text today is another warning. It's the final warning in the book of Hebrews. And the warning in verse 25 comes from the lesser to the greater. You see that in verse 25? If you didn't refuse, if, 
see that you don't refuse him who's speaking. If they didn't escape when they refused when he warned from earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. You see the lesser to the greater. If you are afraid and trembling at the sight of a mall security guard who's overweight and armed with a flashlight, how much less would you escape from a Navy SEAL ripped in the best shape of his life with all of the armor and weaponry that comes with that position? The, he, he says, if they didn't escape when he warned from earth, and the earthly is the, the earthly mountain there in verses 18 through 24, and even the earthly mountain that he describes is no small thing. The earthly mountain that he describes is not an overweight mall security guard. It's the, the lightning and the, th- and, and the earthquake. And he says, if they, if they couldn't escape that, how much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven? And the one, who warms from, the one who warns from heaven is Jesus. Because having accomplished what he came to the earth to do, he is ascended to the throne of the universe. Jesus is the one to whom everything on the earth, even all the things that shake on the earth, all the rocks and all the, all the birds and all the trees, everything on the earth, even all the things that shake on the earth are pointing to the name of Jesus. He is that uncontainable, ferocious ocean into whom every stream and tributary runs because he's Jesus, the one who created and the one who is redeeming. He's the center of gravity. He's the one unshakable core and he's the one who's warning us not to let go of him. Now, I want you to see two key words in verse 25, and I want these words to surprise and galvanize you as you look at this text. Verse 25, the two key words are the word refuse, and secondly, the word escape. See that you don't refuse him who's speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject or refuse him who warns from heaven. You see, it says there, don't refuse The one, see verse 25, who is speaking. The word of God is so dynamic that it's meant to interrupt whatever inner dialogue you have going on right now. So the word of God, even though it's already written and it's it's unchanging, it's spoken of as in the present tense, him who is speaking. Even though it's bound in the pages of scripture, it's so dynamic and it's meant to interrupt your life right now so the word of God is spoken of in the present tense. And what it says here is don't refuse him who is speaking. This is a good corrective for us because sometimes our understanding of the Bible and the gospel, it kind of becomes like a, like a photocopy made on a machine where the toner has run low. And it's sort of, it's still there but it sure is faint and it's not nearly as dramatic and angular and crisp as it ought to be. And I want these two words, refuse and escape, to sharpen the toner in your understanding of the gospel. Because sometimes, and this isn't a bad thing, when we share the gospel, we smile a lot and we talk about, you know, the the illustration that the governor has granted a pardon and you can get out of jail free. We just announce the good news that there's forgiveness here. And when we share the gospel, we're we're presenting a gift of grace, which we are, and we're saying, this is a wonderful gift. It's it's for you. You know, this this is the good news of the gospel. The way this text talks about the gospel is that not only is it a good offer of good news, but the gospel is an ultimatum. And once you've heard it, there is nothing for you but to surrender everything to it or to refuse it. And if you refuse it, our God is a consuming fire. I just think this is a good corrective for us because sometimes half the 
pastor's conferences that I get invited to go to are like, we'll, you know, we'll help you grow your church because if, if people aren't, if people are hardened when you teach and preach the Bible, then you must be doing something wrong. And I've always come up through ministry and believe to this day that if people are hardened when you're preaching and teaching the gospel, there's a good chance that it's because you're doing it exactly right. And it is accomplishing that aroma of death to death that God says the gospel accomplishes sometimes. The hardening or the, the, the inescapable ultimatum of the word of God because the gospel is good news, but what, who Jesus is, he's, he's so real. Everything else can shake. He's the only thing that's unshaken. So Jesus is so incontainably, ferociously real that to, that, that to see him and then say, nah, I don't want that is to refuse and place yourself in an inescapable position where you're facing the, the fiery wrath of Almighty God. Christian ministers are not called to soften the message. In fact, Christian ministers are not called to generate results. Those of you who work with our middle school and high school ministry, those of you who work in ABF leadership, it's as far as I'm a, a leader here kind of overseeing you, I'm not watching to see what results you generate and that they always have to be positive. The Christian minister is not accountable to produce results. The Christian minister is accountable to be faithful, to deliver the reality that is Jesus Christ. And if those to whom Jesus has been presented refuse Jesus Christ, I've discharged my obligation before God if I present him without compromise faithfully. So the first key word is that word refuse. The second key word is that word escape. It says if they did not escape when he warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him from heaven. And this word escape, it shows up here in chapter 12, which is the next to the last chapter and it forms an exact literary inclusio with this word escape was used in the next to the first chapter. If you look at Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 3. So he went through this whole thing, and now at the very end, he's hearkening back to how he began. 2.1, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And then in our text, it says, if they didn't escape when he warned them from earth, how much less will we escape when he warns us from heaven? Escape. Escape what? escape the wrath of our God who is a consuming fire. And the wrath of God, the judgment of God was described in verses 18 through 24 by the two mountains and the wrath of God was the earthquake and the voice and the, the lightning. The wrath of God as it's described in verses 25 through 29 is a wrath of God that shakes not only the earth but also the heavens because our God is a consuming fire. It says, how will we escape? How does one escape the wrath of God? If I'm gonna flee from God, where can I go that God isn't? The message of the gospel is that we can only escape from God by running to God and we flee the wrath of God by hiding in the mercy of that self-same God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That in the, at the cross, the Son of God bore the wrath of God for all those who would be saved. And this is how we escape the wrath of God is that we flee to Jesus. But the question is, how will you escape if you refuse to listen to Jesus? And as this is a warning, I would, warn, I, I would warn you in this moment, in this worship service, I'm tempted to say if there are some of you who are straying into sin 
And maybe if I was talking to two of you, I could say if, because maybe I'd be talking to two good people, <laughs> you know, like that, that managed to, but uh, you know, it's not if. Some of you have significantly strayed into sin this week. And this is a message of warning. Some of you have begun to let go of your hold on church and your hold on Jesus. And this is a warning to you saying, if you do that, how will you escape? If you wander into sin and you wander away from church and away from Jesus, how will you escape? You will escape if your horizon is next Friday or next week or next year. I can't stand up here and tell you that if you wander into sin, it won't be pleasurable and you won't be fine for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a couple of years. Maybe you will. You can escape if all you see is the things that are shaken. But if you, if you see the capital T, capital D, that day, if you see what's coming when the kingdom that cannot be shaken is revealed, if you see that, then you will recognize you can never escape. That day is coming. That day is coming. And so I'd warn you to, to, to not be fooled by the things that are shaken and the passing pleasures of sin, but instead to hear his voice, to repent, to believe, to endure. That's the big idea here by the words not escape and not refuse is that God has spoken to us in his son. And if we reject the revelation of Jesus, God has spoken to us in his son and that is the best news in the universe. But if we refuse that good news and if we reject that good news, then the consequences are unavoidably serious and eternally consequential. Then in verse 26, the contrast continues between heaven and earth. He says, uh, his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And this is a quotation from Haggai 2. In that Old Testament prophet, Haggai, they're, they're actually building the temple and God kind of says there, um, I'm gonna shake the earth and all the treasures of the world will like tumble into my temple. And, and then God says, and then I'll just shake the whole earth and the whole heavens, heavens and I'll make it all new anyway. This day is coming when all that is, you see what it says there? This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Notice that in verse 27. All of the all of the corruptible, defiling, material things that have been made will be shaken. But if you notice in verse 27, God doesn't just say everything that can be shaken will, will, will disappear. He says there, you see it in verse 27, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Listen, our God is good. And what he's about in shaking all the material things is not creating an emptiness where we have nothing. God is accomplishing the things that cannot be shaken, the perfect work of his son. And so the reason everything shakes is so that this good news that cannot be shaken will remain. This is a warning about the judgment. Listen to it in another place. Go like two books forward to 2 Peter it's just like two books forward in the New Testament. Not 1 Peter, but 2 and then chapter 3. First, 2 Peter 3, verse 8. In Hebrews 12, the word image is of things that are shaken. In 2 Peter 3, the word image is of things that are burned. But he's talking about the same thing. Have you ever heard this verse? Verse 8. 2 Peter 3, verse 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the, with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. Ever heard that verse before? We had the children up here today. We'll have them back up here tonight. Life goes on. Some of you are here with your kids, but a few years ago, you were the kids who were up here singing. That's the way life is. Day after day goes and year after year goes. And with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. That's good news. 
Listen to this, not wishing that any should perish. That's great compassionate news, but that all should reach repentance. But, The day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and even hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt Melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we're waiting for a new heavens and a new earth, an unshakable new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. The, the image here is that everything down here that is shaken, all the things that are made, will burn and then be dissolved. Picture uh, a wooden structure burning, and there's a black outline where the structure was, but you walk up to that and when you touch it, the ashes just dissolve and there's nothing left. In Hebrews 12, the image is of shaking. Here, it's of burning and dissolving. This world will be shaken, but the things that are shaken and the things that burn up are only the things that don't remain. Remember it said in Hebrews 12, verse 27, God will remove everything that is shaken in order that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. This is a, an, an, aw, an awful word of judgment, but this is the sweetest word of consolation for my sisters and my brothers here in this moment and you are brokenhearted because the things in your life that can be shaken have broken your heart. I've been there. This this life does not add up to what you wanted it to add up to. And what this is saying is that hurts and that's a loss, but the only thing that you're losing are the things that can be shaken because if you are in Christ, the things that cannot be shaken will remain. A text like this about the divine coming judgment is meant to be like a kick in the shin. It is meant to be unignorable. And we get so lulled into thinking that we have tomorrow and we have the next day and we get so wrapped up in the things that are shaken that we no longer see. But this, this, is, this is, you know what this is meant to say to you. It's meant to say to you, if you, if you are living your life right now and putting all of your chips and and all of your hopes for happiness in the things that can be shaken, you are making a fool's choice. Don't live that way. You know what this is saying to you? If you are living as a Christian and day by day on the campus or in the workplace or in your family, you are afraid of what people who don't love Jesus will say or think about you, you are living in an absolutely insane manner because you're letting those who refuse and who will not escape our God who is an unquenchable fire, you're letting them dictate who you're going to be and what you're going to say. It's a crazy way to live. You know what this text is saying? It is warning you who have begun to cash in your Christian commitment for the passing pleasures of sin. It's saying that's the worst choice you could make. It's a warning. Don't drift. Don't refuse. Listen and obey. So let me summarize this paragraph with two sharp, almost serrated truths that come out of this text. Truth number one is identity. And we'll say it this way, identity. We are pilgrims, but we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Identity. We are pilgrims, but we, receive, but we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We are homeless, but we have received a homeland that cannot be shaken. We are sojourners, but we have received 
a citizenship that cannot be shaken. We have lost everything, but we have received possessions that endure forever that are incorruptible. We're pilgrims, but we've received a kingdom that can't be shaken. This is what we've received. What is the kingdom that cannot be shaken? Hebrews 13, verse 14. Hebrews 13, verse 14. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. That's a verse. That's a verse and a half there. You face divorce, you face death, you face everything that just absolutely breaks your hopes and your heart. You say, here, 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 I have no lasting city, but I seek the city that is to come. What's the unshakable kingdom? It's spoken of in Hebrews 11, verse 10. It says there in 11.10, uh, for he was looking forward to that city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The city that's unshakable, it's described in Hebrews 11, verse 13 and following. Hebrews 11, verse 13. All these died in faith. They hadn't received the unshakable things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged they were pilgrims, strangers, exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland that can't be shaken. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have an opportunity to return. In other words, if they were living their life for the things that could be shaken, they could go back to them. Oh, but you see how it says it there? But as it is, oh, I love verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city I have decided to follow Jesus I'm not going to be ashamed of him I'm not going to go backwards off of him I'm not going to hedge my bets and try to find some pleasure in other things and half of it in him I'm going to follow Jesus and if I follow him this is what he says he is not ashamed to call me his and he is preparing for me a place in which there is joy forevermore unshakable joy, undissolvable joy. This is our identity. Here we have no lasting city, but we have received the city that is unshaken. This text is saying, have you ever thought about this? This is something to talk about at lunch if you want to. This, this, this will make your week. This text is saying, the only people who actually possess anything that cannot be taken away are Christian people. The only people who actually possess anything that cannot be taken away are Christian persons. This is our identity. And yet, you and I, we let this identity just sort of grow cobwebby and, 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 and out there because there are a thousand shakeable things vying for our attention. And those things fill our hearts and those things fill our attentiveness and, and, we, and we, just, we just don't see the way that we should. And we let the world, this is worldliness, we let the world determine for us what are the things that are worth investing in. And we don't see life the way that we should. Instead, we should see that we've received an unshakable kingdom and th th that's where verse 28 comes in. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Our identity as pilgrims leads to our main activity, which is worship. Now, verse 28 is about worship and being a, a wholeheartedly lazy guy, like I wanted to go see Avengers last week and not work on the sermon, I, I called Brennan. I said, Brennan, this text is about worship. So I, I want you to study it and get back to me. And he said, okay. <laughs> so I asked Brennan to work on verse 28 and of several really helpful things that he told me, this is one that I wrote down. Brennan said, the word acceptable in verse 28 is a very strong and even startling word. You see it? Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and let us offer to God acceptable worship. And Brennan said, that doesn't mean acceptable like in, in your eyes and my eyes. Like if next Sunday I just wore a Tommy Bahama shirt and shorts. 
that would be unacceptable to some of you. Maybe that's the reason I should do it, but that's a sermon for another day. Like, it's, this isn't talking about if it's acceptable like to people. This verse actually says, I mean, you already did it because we already sang. We're gonna sing again, but it says the worship that you just offered up, God looked at it and as it were, evaluated it as acceptable or rejectable. And what is it that it says? Therefore, because we, because we love and we see and we inherit the things that cannot be shaken, therefore, our hearts are filled with gratitude and our worship to God is filled with reverence and awe. This is the God who will dissolve the heavens and the earth with his voice. And we're going to come into his presence with a song How do we get this gratitude, this reverence, and this awe? The only way is to see what is the kingdom that cannot be shaken and how have we received it? Man, we, we, have, we have so many apps and instas and dozens of things that just ding for our attention. And I'm just, I just always picture an, an, a very old woman who I know and I'm friends with. She got, a, she got a beat up black Bible printed on very cheap paper with very narrow margins. She can barely see it with a magnifying glass and she understands what life is really about. What are the things that cannot be shaken? It's almost, it's almost wrong that I have to tell you this, but what if you took a white, not what if, it's almost wrong that I have to tell you to do this. Take a white piece of paper and write on the top of it, what is my life really about? And this week, take 30 minutes with no noise, with that piece of paper and a Bible and think about it. You won't you, you will only be able to do this assignment right if you do it for about 30 minutes like every week of your life because you, it slips and it slips and, and whatever's the latest media thing that's happening, we get all wrapped up in the things that are shaken. We all do. But it is, it is the things that cannot be shaken that are gonna matter in the end. Oh, how much heart time, how much soul energy do we pour into those things? We're only gonna do it if we know that our identity is that of a pilgrim. I said there were two sharp truths. There's just one more. And this one is theology. And we'll put it this way. Theology. Our God is a consuming fire, but he has forgiven and accepted us. Our God is a consuming fire, but he has forgiven and accepted us. Verse 29 says our God is a consuming fire. Verse 29 is a quotation from Hebrews 4, I'm sorry, from Deuteronomy 4, verse 24. Listen to Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, which is, which is where it says God's a fire. It says this, um, take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and do not make any carved image in the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. The Lord your God is a jealous God. That's Deuteronomy 4, 24. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. The Lord your God is a jealous God. So the image or the metaphor of consuming fire is meant to communicate the theological truth of divine jealousy, that the Lord your God is a jealous God. What does it mean that God's jealous? Well, it certainly doesn't mean that God's like weirdly possessive or like overcome by envy and kind of insecure and enraged about what we're doing. That's not the way God is. Divine jealousy is the ardent desire and absolute insistence. Divine jealousy is the ardent desire and absolute insistence for exclusive devotion in a relationship of covenant love. Divine jealousy is the ardent desire and absolute insistence for exclusive devotion in a relationship of covenant love. That's what good jealousy is. It is the insistence on exclusive devotion. That's why idolatry 
is spiritual adultery. And fidelity to Christ is spiritual marriage and fidelity within the covenant of love in redemption. God is jealous over us because Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross for us, despised the shame for us. This is why God is jealous over us. And it's the apparent contradiction of the, the, the fiery wrath of jealousy and gospel mercy. It's that apparent contradiction that gives us the vital consistency. And it's often that way because after all, we're talking about God who's like so far above us. It's the apparent paradoxes and the apparent contradictions that actually lock together what we believe about redemption in such, in such wonderful God-oriented truthfulness. It is the fire of God's jealous love that issues forth from the costliness of the mercy with which he wooed us in Christ. This covenant relationship that he has with us, that he wants us to be faithful to, is not a take it or leave it relationship. It represents the bruising and beating and bleeding of his very son. The son of God who one day will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. This one was crucified and died in weakness that we might have exclusive devotion to God and God's ardent desire for that and, and, and God's covenant love enabling that is what's expressed here. And so it's the reality of his mercy and his love that's married to the reality of his jealousy where we put those things together. So we put together our identity as pilgrims and our theology of God as a consuming fire and this leads us to worship. So I'd invite the musicians, the instrumentalists to come forward and the worship leaders to come forward. We're gonna close by worshiping together. Here's the amazing thing about our point of identity that we're pilgrims but we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And here's the amazing thing about our theology that our God's a consuming fire and yet he has forgiven and accepted us. The amazing thing about being a pilgrim and a sojourner and letting go of everything that can be shaken. How many times did Jesus say, do you wanna come after me? You can't bring a backpack, right? How many times did Jesus say, if anyone will come after me, he has to let go of everything in order to follow me. How many times did Jesus say that? So many times. You see in this text, when Jesus says to follow me, you have to let go of everything, this is what Jesus is saying. I love you so much. If you're gonna follow me, you need to let go of everything that can be shaken because you couldn't hold on to it anyway. And if you follow me, you have the one thing that can never be shaken. This, this is how these lock together in gospel truth the very same God who is a consuming fire has loved us so that on the cross of Jesus, when he spread out his arms, it was as if the fire and the wrath of God poured down upon him and charred his back. And those of us who are in Christ, the only place that we could escape from that fiery wrath of God was to run and hide underneath the shelter that he created. So the wrath of God falls on him and not a single flame of it licked even the, even the hair on the back of our fingers. We're safe if we shelter in Jesus Christ. If we have such a God and such a Savior, let us Racine Bible, let us be grateful for we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Stand as we sing. We had 
turned from God to sin's disgrace, we chose the path to hell. Perfect law of God condemned our race, for all in Adam fell. But the righteousness of God appeared, and the world found hope again. For the righteous one has come down to bear all the curse of sin and death. Now to him. to God forever. And now Racine Bible Church, it remains to speak the word of benediction. The word of benediction to you this morning is that if you are in Christ, all the things that are shaken will let you down. All the things that can be shaken will not last. We have no eternal promises regarding them. But if you are in Christ, you have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken and it is yours forever, amen.